Hello everybody, my name is Roger O'Sullivan. I'm delighted to welcome you here to the panel discussion. Uh, we're joined by uh, Dylan Williams. Uh, we're joined by Tony Tracy from uh, Galway University. Uh, we're joined by Fergal Fox from the Health Service Executive in Ireland. Uh, we're joined by Frank Silverstein, uh, the Director of Lousy. So we're going to have a, a great conversation now for the next while. Please make sure if you have questions, please submit them. The first part, we'll have a discussion. Uh, there'll be some questions, uh, and then there's a chance uh, for the questions you're submitting to be asked. So we're going to kick off now. Uh, so please, again, submit your questions. Uh, first question is really for Frank and Dylan. Uh, both films are very personal. It's a real close up insight into your family life. What motivated you both to make these films? And did you have any concerns or reservations about sharing uh, behind the curtain? Frank, so, Frank. Fra uh, Frank, if you want to go first. Sure. Um, so I was motivated to make the film because of that first conversation that I had with my parents when they didn't recognize me. And I completely was shocked. And I just whipped out my cell phone and I asked them about it. And um, then I began collecting uh, more and more ex odd exchanges that I was having with my parents. And I, I didn't really have a, a final image of how the film was going to come out because I just didn't even know that I was making a film. I just started collecting these things. Uh, and I did have reservations about uh, making these things public. Um, I wanted my my brother primarily to not feel embarrassed or awkward about it. And once he said it was fine, then I was happy to show it. Um, I think it was important for people to see behind the curtain what this experience is, what dementia is and isn't, uh, because I think there's a lot of misinformation about it. Is it's a it's such a powerful film to, you know to watch it's, it's such an emotional i found it a very emotional film and just the conversations um i know tony has has a question uh, uh about your film but what we'll do is we'll, we'll go to dylan now just maybe dylan do you want to share because again it's a it's a, it's a different film but it's, it's the same behind the curtains experience uh yes um I think sim similarly to to Frank, um, <clears throat> it was just a, just a fact. I mean, my father's um, ninety years old, and um, he'd never actually telephoned me uh, in my life. I always used to telephone him, or I would telephone my mother would answer, say your dad says hello. <clears throat> so when he actually telephoned me to say he was. Not only he'd sold the house, which was a bit of a shock because I didn't know about it, but he had two containers outside that were full. So I kind of had this feeling that there was this massive shift in his own, in his own mind. And um, it was very much a personal film. It was a feeling for me that I, I, you know, the whole idea, what is your home? Where do you belong, et cetera. So those triggered in me a feeling that I really wanted to go back. And um, so it was never a thought of, making a film in a way but i mean uh, being a professional filmmaker i always have a camera so i started to film and um i was just so so moved you know by what was happening and i was so curious and those two things are usually sign of something that you really you know will gain a lot from personally and that's why i do a lot of the films is it's something that you know brings that curiosity so that's it. Dylan, I'm, you know, I'm a researcher and uh, you know, every project to me is a research project. So, you know, going on holidays is a research project. So, I, you know, I get out all my tools. You know, I'm always a researcher. And I suppose that's maybe a bit like, a, you know, a filmmaker. You're, you're always a filmmaker, no matter what the situation is. Uh, Very much so. I mean, you know, and uh, I, I did another film uh, a few years ago, about my own 40 year crisis, actually, um, which I was sort of the main character was, that was called men who swim because i'm a member of a male synchronized swimming team um which is you know that's another story and another but it was a very similar um set of of issues and questions and if you like and 
I didn't think it was going to be a film until I went up and saw the choir singing, and it just it just knocked me knocked me sideways, you know. And um, and it, I've been a professional filmmaker for twenty years, and I often thinking, oh, how am I going to sell it? Who am I going to sell it to? And this was the first time I didn't even have any thoughts, and it's never been a part of my making of this. It's just been, God, this is a great opportunity for me to spend some great time with my dad, and um, and that's how it turned out. That's brilliant. Um, Frank, in terms of the two films, whether, are there any common themes that you felt between both but both of the films? I know, that, given that they're very different. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because when I when I saw what your film was, what Dylan's film was about, I, I couldn't imagine that there would be anything that we had in common. Uh, but watching them, I was really shocked by how there were a lot of similarities. I mean, first of all, the music is sort of obvious in a certain way. Um, the music in, in Dylan's film connect, is really about his father connecting with this community of uh, his chorus. Um, and the music in mm, for my mother was a way of for her to connect with the outside world that she used to be part of. Um, it made her feel comfortable and feel like she belonged somewhere because she recognized those um, lyrics. Um, I also thought that a lot of it had to do with both of us being in a way, main characters in these films, myself and Dylan, um, and in that we both were sort of off-camera presences and trying to figure out, having been children to our parents, now our parents being um, much more less independent than they used to be and we being far more independent than we used to be and sort of navigating that. Um, and trying to figure out in the tone of voice that we had of, you know, how to be gentle, how to be um, clear and honest without being overly sentimental or sort of sugary. Um, I also thought that um, it show both films really focused on how difficult it is for people of our parents' age to remain engaged. Um, and what they had to do to keep that engagement. I mean, with dementia, it's far more difficult than for Dylan's father, but um, it was obviously quite difficult for him also to sort of not become disengaged. So um, I think those were, I mean, there were superficial things like both of us starting our films because of an odd conversation that we had. Um, and, um, I think uh, so. Those are those are some of the similarities that I noticed. Thanks very much, Frank. And uh, there's a few questions in the chat box. But, and uh, Dylan and, and Frank, there's a question there for you from uh, Paula. It's uh, who would you most want to show your film to lead action? Lead to action. Have you any thoughts about who you would want to make sure sees your your films? Well, um, actually, that's one. That's a very interesting point. I think that um, often when I I make uh, films, I'm often it's often the first question: Who is the audience um, for this film? Um, I mean, I made a film about the destruction of the Borneo rainforest, and straight away I was trying to think: Well, who are the stakeholders involved, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, this film is slightly different because the audience was me in in many ways. I was making it for my own and was quite more of a more of a egotistical thing in that way but as it's gone along i've actually been thinking a lot about the issues now whereas i think frank and my film are very different is that my fa my father my, is very vital i mean he's still extremely vital you know um and i didn't the 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 anxiety that i felt was more on my side than on, on his in many ways he was just you know but for me, it was just sort of trying to find a mapping his narrative of his life, you know, and, and finding value in something that I'd never found value in before. Um, but one of the organisations I've been sort of talking to a lot is Loneliness UK, which is, a, you know, I think that the one thing I did realise from my father is that he, without the structured 
arena of his choir, it would be very difficult for him to have that connection. And that was something that connected a lot of the men. I mean, men um, as, a, as a whole, maybe that generation, more of the younger generations, have, find it difficult to talk about their emotions, find it difficult to share in many ways. So I was thinking that Loneliness UK, because there are a lot of people who do find it difficult to share and to have that sense of being able to go and offload and have something. So they're, they're an organization that, that I think uh, one of the organizations, how we can reach the many people who maybe need to post pandemic, if we can dare say that, get them out of the house, get down the local club, wherever you are, you know, have a cup of tea or a, or a, or a pint, you know, it gives you that vitality, you know, and that's, that's gives you that sense of direction, forward momentum, things to do. Okay. That would brilliant. be my audience. Brilliant. And um, Frank, do you have any, who, who do you want to make sure sees this film of yours? So I would think that there's two groups of people that um, I think would be the audience that I imagine is um, people like myself who are caregivers of um, parents or friends or other people that with dementia. I think that uh, it's a very it's very confusing and very emotional and really difficult uh, path to tread. Um, and I think that watching my parents, who at this point had ex sort of advanced stage, um, to see where you're headed and what that looks and sounds like for real. Uh, and I also think for uh, medical people, whether it's um, doctors or um, nursing staffs, uh, because I think it provokes a conversation of, oh my gosh, my mother did exactly the same thing. And so it opens up an avenue for conversations that are people often don't want to have or don't know how to begin. Thanks very much, Frank. I know before you go, um, uh, Tony, uh, is, uh, I think you mentioned you want to ask Frank a question about his, his uh, move it you're on site you're on silence so if you want to i've been si i've been silent <laughs> <laughs> many many people would like to have that facility around me <laughs> um yeah so um i was talking to frank a little bit off uh, before i came on uh when before we came on and um one of the things i'm, I'm sort of i'm a film scholar as well as the uh, son of aging parents. So it's funny because the, these two things, these two films really affected me on a personal level as well as a kind of professional level. And one of the things I'm interested in is um, how aging uh, gets represented, you know, uh, how, how um, and these films make really valuable contribution to that project, that kind of, and, and actually what's kind of exciting about this, this is that this is, we're in an early, early enough stage about representations of aging. I mean, there, there have been old people or older people, as we say, in um, film for quite a long time, but they have generally been confined to sort of secondary roles or um, stereotypical roles, or, you know, you know, a limited number of young and older characters. So dementia per se, or personal stories are, are relatively new. And I'm very interested in, in the last even year, um, there's been a sort of spate of these kind of films about dementia. And I'm thinking of Dick Johnson is Dead, for instance, which was on um, Netflix. Um, there was uh, one with Stanley Tucci. Uh, I'm just forgetting the name of it now, where Stanley Tucci's a gay man in a relationship with Colin Firth. Is it called Sundown? Or I, I've forgotten the name of the title now. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and and anyway, a number of films with uh, and the father and so on. And it strikes me that dementia uh, offers uh, particular challenges. In, in terms of representation, because it, you know, in film you're trying to sort of draw out a character, and but dementia resists that um, and identification. So what I was interested in with Frank's film in particular uh, was how he achieved a tone that was both sensitive uh, to his parents, but also, I guess, not patronizing or uh, wasn't uh, uh, too melancholic in a sense. And, and I, I thought he did something really interesting with tone in the film, which is a very difficult quality to speak about. Um, and I, th I think one element he did there was, a, was to do with music and the way music works. But I just wanted to ask him a little bit about that, how he 
how he found that tone. And I watched it again tonight, and particularly that closing um, shot in particular struck me. So that question of tone uh, and, and the representation of his parents, I find very interesting. Um, so I would say that what I did was I was looking to be as honest about their experience as I could be. Um, and I tried to find moment, there are quite a different range of emotions and things that they express uh, from being extremely angry and anxious to being really caring and loving. And um, I, w I wanted to let each of those things play out as they could and to represent them for what they were. So um, when my mother just has no clue where she is, um, I really thought, tried to put myself in her shoes and imagine how would it feel if I was in a hospital and I didn't understand even that I was in a hospital. Um, or when my father starts lashing out at my mother for nothing that she did, um, and they loved each other immensely. They were a very close couple. Uh, sh it shocked me. Or when my father announced he was going to New Zealand out of nowhere, um, you know, I thought it was hilarious. And at the same time, um, you know, very upsetting. So I really wanted to let these things play out the way they were and not to try to um, make them cute or make them um, what they weren't. So I, I, I just was trying to be honest to myself about what I was seeing, I guess. Is, and I let, let them drive it. Um, I would say also that what I discovered that was also surprising is that my parents' personalities and the central core of who they were, even though they were completely distorted, um, remained in a lot of ways. I mean, my father was a very optimistic guy and didn't look backwards. And he's like, oh, you got to go to New Zealand sometime. So <laughs> that was, I mean, that really was him, even though he was completely demented when he said it. Um, and my mother, um, she was always kind of wanted to be in control of things. And, um, you know, she wanted to have the dinner when the dinner was supposed to be served and it was going to have four courses and she was going to make sure that it had the exact right kind of spices or whatever. I mean, and she wanted, even as she, in her demented state, she insisted on trying to control things, even though she had no clue where they were. So I gave, it was, I, I kind of tried to use them as my guide for what the voice, the tone of voice was, I guess. And can I, can I just make a quick observation about that? Because I just want to, before you go, I think the, the, great, the great value of that is it's really non-judgmental. You know, it, it really doesn't try and impose meaning on, on the whole thing, which is what narrative films very often try to do through an arc and through a triac structure and all those kinds of things. And I think that one of the things the film does is you're never quite sure where you stand. You're never sure at what point in the story you are. In fact, the film resists story. It doesn't even have the thing at the end where we have what happened to them next or what, you know. And for me, I thought that was really joyous in a sense. It was a real honoring of them as people an honoring of their lives. But also in some senses, it reflected their condition in a really um, man mannerly and, and just respectful manner, you know. Well, th thank you very much, Frank. I really, yeah. I really appreciate you taking part in the panel and uh, thanks for answering those questions. Uh, Tony, uh, just to go back to Dylan's film, and then Fergal, uh, uh, I'm going to come to you after. Um, Tony, so in terms of Dylan's film, what were the themes or aspects from, you know, given your, your work in this area, what are the themes or aspects that stood out for you and men who sing? Well, what was amazing about Dylan's film was that how many of the, how many boxes it ticked, you know, I, I, like his father just seemed to, to sort of come up with the right things to say at the right time. Um, I liked the way Dylan's film sort of started off, and I mentioned this to him earlier, about how it was sort of a neat arc at the beginning, you know, the first sort of act, if you want to call it that, how he comes home, the, his father makes a call to him, and then he said it was time to go home. And there was a, there was a kind of a sense of, I, say, I guess, a kind of sense of sadness, you know, and withdrawal. And then it stops, you know, and, and then it reverses and, and goes in another direction. Um, and I think that that sums up, first of all, how many of us feel about 
our aging parents or about age that it's an there's an inevitable decline you know there's a sense of inevitability to it um but his father and dylan himself sort of go against that you know and, and that's what the rest of the film becomes it becomes about starting again about resilience about resistance but also what i really like about it, it was not it was not a denial of aging you know it was not a denial that some of the men are ill or that uh, we're getting on and I, I and there's a kind of a brilliant allegorical function of the notion of the voice getting weaker but at the same time the voice still persisting um and and the voice rec des desiring to express itself um but quite aside from that um it has it has lots of great themes you know obviously I, I think Dylan has said it elsewhere about belonging, about finding community, about about finding purpose. I, I love the idea that we all want to be in competitions, you know, that just <laughs> just singing by itself is not quite, you know, it's good, but like, let's get into a competition. You know, there has to be a kind of raison d'etre and some sense of um, of, of purpose. Um, um, and also what I, I another thing, there's an issue of men's health. There's a very funny scene on the bus you know, where uh, his father speaks to the, the other man about having visited a doctor recently, <laughs> um, uh, which was very amusing indeed. Um, but uh, the other th theme that struck me is uh, the life of the older single, single man, um, the widower, um, and uh, the routines um, that are, and uh, Dylan does a beautiful job of uh, changing his mind on the routines, uh, about seeing them as sort of limiting, but then sees them as actually structuring. Um, and 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 grows more and more respectful, I think, of that. But I was struck by his father's courage, really, and um, not so much resilience as kind of belligerence, but just a kind of sense of uh, of strength and uh, and and going on and not feeling any any way sorry for himself. So issues around health, around looking after yourself, around participation. And also, of obviously, and there's a lot of research on on the on themes of singing, both for mental health and for physical health. Um, so it's a, it's a rich film that I would be really keen to show to um, older audiences um, and older men in particular. And if I might just finish by saying what I liked about both of these films is that they were they were sons looking at fathers, looking at parents, and you know that kind of intergenerational observation, particularly from sons' point of view, I think is a new and exciting kind of perspective to bring to aging it's it's not one we see or have heard a lot of thanks tony um before i bring in fergal and dylan just to come back um on what tony was saying one of the things i was struck by the wisdom in the film and the wisdom of the the characteristics i mean wisdom and in, in different in a different way rather than education or intelligence just you know just that that sense of wisdom and you mentioned loneliness and um, there was a, a great piece of work undertaken that looked at uh, groups of characteristics that people had in different parts of the world. And they discovered that people who feel they have wisdom rather than intelligence or education are less likely to report loneliness than mm. others. Because when you have wisdom, people come and ask you questions. People come to talk to you. People ask you your view. And, that, and you know, I was taking a note of some of the of, of the various points and uh, throughout the film, thinking, oh, that's such an insight. That's such a great bit of bit of wisdom. So, yeah. Dylan, before I get you to comment, I'm going to get Fergal because Fergal, you know, from a public health perspective and a men's health perspective, there's various themes that, uh, you know, maybe that ring home that reflect stories that are told or untold. Do you want to share what some of those observations, Fergal? Yeah, well, just to go back to just what you said there about the, the wisdom and the learning, um, you know, there's a beautiful or one of my favorite bits of the movie is where he's going through the list for the Christmas cards. Mm -hmm. And I think Dylan says, why don't you just make a new list? Like, you know, it's crazy, this scrap of paper been all scribbled over it. And, and he just hit him with just some beautiful wisdom. These people, you know, you don't want to forget about them. And I mm. thought, oh, my God. That's such a father son wisdom thing, you know what I mean? It's such an obvious thing to a young man who might say, just make a new list, have a nice tidy list. And it's not about the list at all, it's all about the people. So I thought the film, like it really hit so many golden moments where you just, it just hits you, you know, like where, where like obviously the, the peak of the movie was watching, for me, was watching the fathers, you know, tell Dylan, I want Sam 23 at my funeral. And, and again, it's kind of like a young man's question, like why? why why that and it just it touches me mm. and you know like i you know it was just such a pure golden moment um mm. 
and the you know the the themes that Tony mentioned there about the father son transitions for me was a massive theme and and just like Tony said before or I think it might have been you like the you know the resistance that they showed in the rest of the movie was like we're we you know we may be uh, older men but there's raging against the dying of the lights with this going seizing the opportunity of the competition as this like charge the light brigade um, so I, I thought I thought I really enjoyed the movie from a men's health perspective I thought you know from like I, I work in the health service and and we're trying to you know prioritize engagement of men um, and, and we've we've identified middle-aged men and older men as a priority for social and emotional engagement and when you can get that at community level it feeds back on itself you know and and choirs is uh you know it's a fantastic way of doing it I, i'm involved in the workplace choir and i promote workplace choirs as a health promotion intervention for health service staff and i, I can really see how it kind of multiplies itself you know it, it you give a bit of good and then you join a group and they give a bit of good and you get that good back in multiplied and then you go perform for somebody for like uh, like we used to go to nursing homes and things like that in the good days and uh the um you get it back in spades you know you, you see the impact that you can have on people so the 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 choir is a beautiful representation of that kind of that social engagement and that uh, multiplying factor that performing has bringing the men together but then letting them even the performing at the memorial services and at the funerals that was really sad and poignant but but really is kind of uh making those men feel connected you know so like like uh, Roger, you'd be familiar with the, the concept of social prescribing, where we're trying to get support people into community supports, uh, community initiatives. And, and you know, the choir is, is a real simple example of that. So you can see what all these men are getting out of it. Yeah. So from a men's health perspective, I thought, you know, there's so many, like obviously the father-son relationship would be one of the big things, but, but that uh, the father is so socially and emotionally aware. And he's he's teaching us in this movie. Like this 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 movie is very it'd be a fantastic educational tool for men of all ages, you know, because they can you're learning from Dylan. Dylan is on the journey himself. Um, and the father is, you know, struggling, like the scene where he's sitting at the bottom of the step of the stairs as they're moving house, or he's moving out. Like it's just so poignant. Mm. Really guesses, you know, it really hits you hard you know, the journey and the, the transition and, you know, so there's so much learning in this. I think there's just something for every man, never mind, to, like it obviously, if you're watching it as a man, it, it makes you reflect on your own father-son relationship, whatever that is. Yeah. But to see the, the, you know, so sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a, on a rant here. I really enjoyed the movie. No, um, that's perfect, Fergal. It really is. It, it really is. No, no, you've covered, uh, uh, you know, given your role within the health service, exactly, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that it rings so many points. I'm really, I'm really delighted. So Dylan, um, do you want to reflect? Because uh, we've covered a lot there, but uh, and it's nice the, the type of feedback you're getting. I'm sure. So do you want to reflect on what you what you've heard? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're gonna have to stop me if I go into a rant now because you you <laughs> both you both encapsulated so many elements of what I sort of what. I mean, I didn't set out, but what I actually ended up finding, and that was maybe, you know, the area which I was from is an area that has been left. So all the men in that choir, their sons, people have left it. And sometimes you you leave a, a, a relationship. You don't foster a relationship. You're talking about wisdom, which is that we communicate intergenerational. We listen to one another. And these mm -hmm. these men... They, they decided to go for a competition. Why? Because I was there with a the camera. It felt that somebody was listening to them. They suddenly felt proud and they had something to say because somebody was there who wanted to learn from them. Yeah. You know, and, and my father, and, you know, he, he had his mother and then he met my mother, you know, and then when my mother died, he was suddenly on his own for the first time in his life, you know, and that's why he sort of started to develop these new... And... I remember after she died, um, we were driving the car and he drove into like a little lay by on the motor and he looked at me and he says, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And it was, and I, we, I'd never even come close to having conversation with my father about anything 
and suddenly for me to start to find a new narrative a new way of talking with him um but then also a new way in in a wider sense a new way to look at the society where i was from rather than sort of brushing it over with a with an eye of a teenager or a young man thinking mm. ah i'm from the ugliest seaside town in the world you know it's a lovely line to throw out mm. but it's actually it's my seaside town you know and to sort of start ownership and to start looking at things and valuing things that maybe are different to me you know you think you're modern you think you're taking on new achievements but to actually to value and to realize on the street that i live there are all these different experiences and people and we don't have that crucible where we necessarily are eating together and how we can create that that sense and community is one of them is one of the themes that is closest to my heart in in many of the films that i make it's just i feel that many words go unspoken mm. um and that was you know that was the the point part for me about my father speaking about how he wants his funeral my father telling me about that but there was a lot of humor mm. you know it, it uh, you know i mean um frank's film was a very serious mind mine was more of a celebration of that community and 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 also enjoying those conversations you know so it, it was supposed to be uplifting mm. um, I, I but, think one, of, one of the lines uh, uh, sorry <laughs> I, uh, no, I just want to make a tiny point which, which was that i just want to congratulate the programmers of the festival for putting those two films together i think it's really important because you know if you put a, a film about dementia with another film about dementia you know you're sort of saying that's that's what old age looks like Mm -hmm. um, but if you put these two films, you say, well, you know, there's this and there's also this, you know, and I, I think that's a really crucial thing in, in men's health or in, in ger cultural gerontology in general to suggest that there is a multiplicity of experiences uh, about older age. And of course, older age is not one state. It's a very long state. It's 30 odd years for many people, you know. And the other thing that Dylan brings up, I think, and does us all a service in is that our attitudes towards aging shifts with ourselves because we are also aging aging doesn't happen to other people you know which is the way it generally is represented on film we also and it's a gift actually that his father gives him to pull him back in and, and allow him to re you know re reimagine who his father is and also who he is and i age can be there's a gerontologist that talks about the age dividend and in a way the age dividend in this film is the gift that his father gives to him to dylan and which dylan takes and recognizes the gift that's on offer, which is to sort of reevaluate his his relationship with his home place and with himself and, and with his father. So that's a great example of where understanding and pulling the curtain on aging, uh, we benefit from it, you know, I think. Thank, thank, thanks, Tony. Before I go to Fergal, um, we're going to link Anne in, the choir master, and she's going to come in and uh, be part of the panel for, uh, uh, we, believe it or not, guys, We've spoke for 33 minutes at this stage. We're on our last seven minutes. Uh, you know, at the start, people think 40 minutes, that's a long time, but we're having a great conversation here. Fergal, did you, uh, did you want fantastic. to it, Yeah, thanks. No, no, it's fantastic that if, if Anne can come in because um, the role in, of the choir master in these things, and it was lovely that you, you got a little personal insight from Anne um, yeah. It, yeah. to, you know, to insert in the movie, which wasn't really, it really added depth to it and uh, it was amazing to, to hear her, her story about the the male voice choirs the the other piece I, I just wanted to 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 thank you again that moment like how you got so many beautiful quotes out of your dad because you know in the scene where he's apologizing for the food uh, or you know he's feeding you early in the movie he's trying to give you some pasta or something and he's struggling with packing up the house and he says that um he feels like he's digging his own grave and the ground is hard and i thought yeah, oh my yeah. god like that is uh, unbelievable. That's you know, like, my dad. <laughs> you think of all these movies that there's so much effort gone into scripting, and then <laughs> you're, you're pulling pure gold, and he's delivering them like this is just natural, and it's just it's so powerful. Yeah. Um, I really, so I really enjoyed that. Re, re, uh, that. That stood out for me as well. Um, thank you so much for join, joining us. Uh, I have to say, I <laughs> loved your lines throughout. You know, the, are you reading the map upside down? You know, op you know, uh, open your mouth more. Uh, all those lines were, were fantastic. They were, they were so fantastic. So uh, it's really a question for both Dylan and Anne. Um, one about how is, it, how is the film been received 
back home in Wales? Because I always think it always matters about uh, back where you come from, how 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 uh, it's perceived and heard. So what about the choir? How did the 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 men uh, react to seeing the fellow? Anne first, and then. Uh, oh. <laughs> Good evening. It's lovely to be with you, and uh, I must say I've enjoyed well, both films. I have been in tears. I must admit, um, how the men. Well, I think the men have all tried to get to the cinemas to see, and they've all. Uh, really enjoyed the film very, very much. They they were proud to be part of it, and um, the messages there are very strong messages. And I think that even I myself didn't realise how how strong those messages were going to be. Really, as for my lines, I'm not quite sure where they come from. I tend to forget that the cameras were there at times. I think so. Well, there we go. But and that, isn't that the sign of a br of a brilliant? Uh... Uh, film when you forget that you're actually being recorded that you know, that's just that's so natural it was really really good Dylan do you want to add to that because I've got a, a particular question for Anne after this here but Dylan uh, you know um, it's how did when well, did you get any feedback, did you get any, any, any feedback about the film from the different people who took part in it yes I, I did I mean with regards to the to the men I mean as I said before I think when you get to a certain point they they're quite free with their with their opinions, you know. When you get closer to them and they talk, and it was it was like um, I felt as I was going to central casting. You know, you had all these great characters, um, but also um, people who could speak very openly and and um, with this level of trust. I think maybe because I was my dad's son, you know. And then Anne, I mean, Anne is a fantastic character. She just leads the whole groups in in a way where she takes them with her, but it's always with a soft hand, with humor. It's such a, such a warm sense within, within the choir. And, and that really comes through in, in the film. And that's how I really pleased for that. I mean, she's a, she's a rock for those men. Oh, it was great. I, I thought you are, was... you are Han. Yeah. <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> and you, you, you used the line about instilling confidence, you know, and that really, that was a great, a great line, but I want to ask you because of, how did you? How did the choir manage during COVID? You know, because that was such a difficult, a difficult thing for a you know a group activity. That must have been very challenging, especially for the cohort that you're dealing with. It was. It was terribly challenging. I've got two male choirs actually. But one didn't do anything at all. They just left it, and the Trelanwit, uh, the this bunch, they are quite stoic. Really, they were determined to do, and we had zoom sessions now it came as a great surprise to them when we had a committee meeting a zoom and i said well you must realize this does nothing for me whatsoever because i can't hear any of you i just hear me and they all went oh they hadn't even thought about that so unless they're unmute and you can't unmute everybody because it will be total and complete and that's a chaos if you do that so it was but we managed it we did in different ways i did you know we sang uh, we managed to um, do exercises but again as i say i had to lead it and my singing boss a bottom bass is not very good i can't get down that low the other voices weren't too bad and then i managed to get which was important each time was a song either of them singing or a song that they knew with another choir singing and me conducting i've so sort of recorded that and then they were able to sing along but of course you know they were all in their own homes on their own some of them not feeling so comfortable in doing that. Maybe the wife was complaining or the dog or the cats or whatever, or, but, or the neighbors, I don't know. But uh, we managed, that was the important thing because, you know, for a certain time we came together. So we did that once a month and then they had a quiz on the other. So every two weeks we did it and we, and I think it was good that we managed it. You know, some of the older members who've stopped coming to choir, they were able to be there as well. So that was really lovely too. And very, very important for them to have that contact with one another. Um, so thank, important. Um, thank you so much for joining the panel. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And again, really enjoyed uh, your role in, in the film. Um, so we're down to the last two minutes, Dylan, 
Tony and Fergal. Um, this is really our, our chance just to finish off. But one of my thoughts was, you know, how can we use a film like this to engage and stimulate, and both films to engage and stimulate men in those more difficult conversations? Um, Fergal, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, for... yeah, no, the 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 uh, lousy um, movie really made me reflect on our own. Uh, dementia campaign, which I think one of the other speakers or contributors said, you know, the Understand Together campaign that we have in Ireland um, around dementia and and normalising it and, you know, sustaining engagement. And so I think there's, you know, like, like I said about the, um, the Men Who Sing uh, movie, you know, it's it's like an educational tool, really, for, for men of other ages. You know, mm. what what's mm. coming? Uh, let's, t let's take a step back here, you know, like the like, like we know, like I mentioned earlier, middle-aged men and older men are two groups that we 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 want to prioritise in our in uh, in the republic around the our health uh, promotion activities and the likes of men's sheds and things like that um, that we promote at community level. Uh, like men like that would love to see this movie. Like, they would absolutely love to see this movie. And and in terms of, you know, where we know there's a big danger uh, for men who reach middle age, you know, like this movie could really help, like watching Dylan's mm -hmm. journey and Dylan's learning. Mm -hmm. Never mind, you know, showing it in, in a secondary school, a boy's secondary mm -hmm. school. I mean, it's just, um, just, it's just so rich, you know, mm -hmm. and as I said, you think, you know, some of the lines are just so golden. It, it's like, you have to remind yourself, this isn't scripted, like this isn't, you know, one of these, uh, you know, fake real mm -hmm. movies, you know, reality movies, this is real. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's um, you know it won't go off either. I mean this is this is it's just so mm -hmm. so genuine and uh, you know I, I I hope that we can we can share it where it needs to be shared mm -hmm. as a Thanks. like a men's health uh, promotion tool in itself. Thanks, Fergal. That's great. Really positive, Tony. Um, uh, yeah, that's a great. And actually, Fergal, um, maybe we can think about how we might do that because I, I, you know, maybe I can help think about an educational setting, educational stuff around it because it work it works great for me. Um, I uh, yeah, I've been working with men's sheds. We've actually done a little research project about showing representations of older men. There's a documentary called The, the Man Who Wanted to Fly. I don't know if you know this Irish film about a guy who just wants to... Uh, it's a great little film anyway, you should, if you haven't seen it. And one of the things I was saying to, to Frank earlier is that there's a kind of a recent move towards documentaries about older men. Uh, I mean, quite recent. Uh, and I think this, this is a very, very honorable addition to that and getting men to talk about this, but uh, getting men to talk about aging. Men don't want to talk about aging because masculinity is so bound up with not um, getting older. It's about being young and virile and, you know, all the culture of masculinity is around sport and strength and physicality and, and, and those kinds of things and attractiveness. I just want to ask, I just want to ask Dylan a very quick question, which is, Dylan, when you went back and had a look at the older men in, in your home place, did you see differences or how, how does that relate to the culture of male aging in where you live and where you will probably live for a while yet? Um, did you find any kind of comparisons or big differences in that regard? They definitely drink more. Uh, but no, um, well, I, I don't know. I mean, I live in Sweden where it's a very much of an outdoorsy land. I think, I think, for me, there was more of a predilection for community in Wales. People talk to one another more. People are um, more reserved here. It's something that I do very much miss. It's something maybe that I, I think a lot about home. Um, and I think that obviously this is one of the cliches that Swedes are a lonely nation. You know, there's a certain, a certain level of suicides, etc. But I wouldn't necessarily... I mean, human people are people. People have different relationships. There are people from all kind of. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to generalize in that way. Um, I think maybe it was uh, it was the it was the sense of humor in a way. You know, it's, uh, suddenly I was allowed to go um, when I went to the to, to the meeting of the of the of the you know the steering group of the choir, and they're all telling jokes and you know, and I'm I'm still in my mind the. 12 year old boy used to sit in the back of the cold church hall listening to this you know oh. but now suddenly i'm a man as well with the pleated trousers oh yeah boys you know it was kind of like 
I'm I'm one of these men, you know, which I don't I kind of see myself as a boy. Mm -hmm. But then suddenly they were like, you know, open and um uh, vulnerable. Which was the surprising thing how much they you know, between each at the in the in the cons in the, when they practice in the middle, the the chairman would stand up and would say, "Okay, today we're thinking about Phil because his son's not very well, and we're talking thinking about Mervyn and his wife or whatever, you know." And it was like that, such a lovely, soft way of being. And I think that maybe, you know, Shakespeare talks about the seven ages of man. You know, get to the point when you've had a child and you've had a parent who's died and you get to the point where you understand that there is pain, that there is loss, and you have more empathy. It comes naturally with through your own experience. And I think that being with them, I felt very free and very, you know, I really would, I really would join that choir. I would say if I was living there, I really enjoyed their character. I didn't see them as old men. I saw the characters, you know, and and that was a wonderful thing for me. That's lovely. I have That's to brilliant. say, that. That's just a lovely way to finish the conversation just a just a fantastic uh and we're going to now hand over to jerry please everybody stay on line because jerry and her team have brought together a fantastic film festival and i have to say i've been delighted taking part in this uh discussion it it, it was the fastest 46 minutes that i've had in a very long time so thank you to the panel thanks everybody and frank Tony, Dylan, Virgil, and Jerry, thank you for uh, uh, a great program. Thank you. Oh, thank you. thank you, Roger. Thank you to all the panel. And so that just about concludes um, this year's Global Health Film Festival. It's been an amazing 11 days and we've loved sharing so many excellent films with you from around the world. Um, I have to say so many people have contributed uh, so much to making this year's events such a success. Our filmmakers, our moderators, our panels, our trustees, our advisory board, our partners like The Lancet and the Institute of Public Health in Ireland, Andy Spencer, our graphic designer, Richard King from Spirited Pictures, Lauren Anders Brown for hosting our red carpet events and setting up our virtual photo booth every day. And um, most especially our wonderful audience uh, for being here to share in the festival. Um, I'm deeply, deeply grateful to you all, but absolutely, most especially, our completely brilliant volunteer team who have worked so hard on our social media platforms, looking after you all in the chat, um, preparing our resource packs and just being relentlessly perfect in every way. Um, so in alphabetical order um, only by first name, thank you to Amy, Caroline, Chez, Diane, Harry, Haley, Paula, Ricarda, Timo, Vishal and Vix. What an amazing team. And we are going to end this year's Global Health Film Festival on a total high because this amazing choir are going to sing us out. And thank you to the wonderful Anne Atkinson for putting them through their paces once again. And if I can get the tech to work, it has been one of those days. I'm going to hand over to Anne and the choir to um, officially close this year's Global Health Film Festival. So um, goodbye and thank you. Good night. And, um, and we will see you next year. So bear with me one second. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. Don't Bye. don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Just yet. <laughs> Good evening, Global Health Film Festival. From myself, Anne Atkinson, and from the stars of the show, Cord May Beyond Chalounit. We hope you enjoyed watching and discussing men who sing. The film has many important messages about community, humanity and the power and joy of song and we are delighted to officially close your festival this year in our very own special way, the, way we, the only way we know how to sing to you and we'd love to sing for you uh, from the heart a song called A Pure Heart, Calon Lan. Thank you very much. Diolch Amawr.
See you next year. See you next year.